please welcome the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament, Ken McIntosh, MSP, and Dame Margaret Hodge, MP. Thank you very much indeed. My name is Ken McIntosh. I'm the presiding officer here at the Scottish Parliament and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to Holyrood and to the Festival of Politics 2018. Uh, this is our 14th uh, year we've been running the Festival of Politics and it's all about opening up the Parliament, allowing you not just to be here as spectators or uh, as listeners, but as debaters, engaging with politics and politicians <coughs> expressing your own opinions. So that's the key thing, to have some thoughts, some questions, uh, some views, and, and put them across to us as we go forward. And uh, for those of you who are so minded, uh, we're online, hashtag FOP2018, that's Festival of Politics, hashtag FOP2018. And we're broadcasting live on Facebook Live at the moment. Um, so everybody who is watching, feel free. I've brought my laptop and I'll be um, logging in at some point to try and pick up some questions from our online audience to put to Margaret. So I'm delighted to say we are joined by Dean Margaret Hodge. Uh, and uh, if I may give you a little background, uh, Margaret was born Margaret Oppenheimer in 1944 in Cairo to Jewish refugee parents. Her father, a German steel entrepreneur, and her mother from Austria. They moved to England in 1950, where she was educated at Oxford High School for Girls, and where she went on her first Aldermaston March for CND in 1959. She then studied economics and political science at the London School of Economics. She became an economist at Unilever, but Margaret then left when she'd had two of her four children and became involved in community politics. In 1973, she joined Islington Council in London as a Labour councillor, and by 1982 had become its leader. Margaret remained as the leader at its helm for a decade, weathering media storms over loony lefty councils and learning the diplomacy of local government. She was then appointed as a senior public sector consultant for Price Waterhouse between 1992 and 1994, before being elected to the House of Commons as the member for Barking. She was appointed by both Prime Ministers Tony Blair and Gordon Brown in office and has been a Minister of State in several departments, including education, work and pensions, and culture, media and sport. She pioneered the Sure Start programme for children in deprived areas of Britain. In the 2010 election, she fought off the challenge from Nick Griffin and the British National Party in Barking, doubling her majority to over more than 16,000. And, perhaps the subject of much of our discussion this afternoon, from 2010 to 2015, Margaret became the first woman to chair the Public Accounts Committee, and in fact, the first person to be elected to that chair, not just appointed to the chair. And she carved out a reputation for tenaciously tackling uh, both corporate giants such as Amazon and Starbucks and Google on tax avoidance, as well as civil servants and members of HMRC uh, on public accountability. Embroiled in a debate on anti-Semitism within the Labour Party, Margaret has been outspoken in a criticism of the party's stance on the issue. She is a visiting professor at King's College London, and I understand she also plays the piano to concert level. So I'm delighted to introduce Dame Margaret Hodge. Thank you, Margaret. So we've got a lot of um, areas to cover there. And uh, the key here, I'll start the conversation off. Uh, but at any point, if you want to just attract my attention, uh, you want to make a little point or ask a question, just try and catch my eye, wave to me or something like this. Um, and, and we'll try to bring everybody in. Um, but if we can, before we get into the politics of it, I wonder if you just give us a little taste of your early life and perhaps how that shaped your views, your values. Mm. Um, I know in, in, in your book, in your uh, book here, Call to Account, uh, you have a, a, a great story about how you had to eat fruitcake to prove you were British. <laughs> uh, this is true. So we, we came here, my parents were from Germany and Austria, and they settled into Egypt just before the war and I'm one of five, and four, four of us were born in Egypt. And then in 1949, my dad, who was, ran a little stockholding company there, had a, 
brick thrown through his window. And I think, you know, the Holocaust was very sort of uh, immediate for him. And I think he just thought, we've got to get out. And interestingly enough, uh, nobody would take us. We were stateless. And the, we tried to get to America. We tried to get to Australia. We tried to get to Canada. Nobody would take us. And the British accepted us. And my parents were sort of forever grateful to, uh, to Britain for um, allowing us here. And I think if they were alive today, they would be gobsmacked that I'd become such a ridiculous figure of the establishment. Um, but when we arrived, so we arrived in those early days, it is, I have a lot of, em so Im immigration and equality has been at the heart and kernel of my politics. So we arrived and we went into bed and breakfast. And um, my only memory, when I was not five, my only memory was cabbage and porridge. Um, <clears throat> and I'd been used to eating mango and, <laughs> and uh, you know, pita bread and all this lovely stuff. And I had overcooked cabbage and tasteless porridge. Uh, but I sort of obviously adjusted. But I do have the memory of us getting our citizenship. And it's an interesting story. So this was 1954. And my mother was very, very ill. I was 9, 10, just about that age. So she was... She was actually dying in hospital. So, but my dad was desperate to get us citizenship because we had no passport, so we couldn't travel. And an ins in those days, this is a, such a long time, an inspector came to tea. And my older sister and brother, my sister was at university, my brother was away at school. So there were two of us, me aged nine, 10, and my sister aged six, seven. And we had a tea with this inspector. And we always, tea for us was, you know, boiled egg with fingers, toast, that sort of stuff. But on that day, we had tea in the sitting room, which we never did, and we had cucumber sandwiches and fruitcake. <laughs> and I couldn't stand fruitcake because it was all that dried fruit, and I was used to all the fresh fruit that I'd grown up with. But I was told by my dad, in no uncertain terms, I had to pretend that that's what we had forever. Um, and actually, we were questioned. I was asked who my friends were what games I played, what books I read. So it was a real, inter it was a sort of hostile environment. It's sort of a hostile environment, which exists even today against people coming in. But we did get through and we got our British citizenship. But that's always made me feel an outsider. That's why I tell that story. So although I feel deeply British and European, I feel very European and very British, I nevertheless have never felt a part of the British establishment. And when, as a terrible teenager, I was sent off to... My dad couldn't cope with me, so he sent me off to a boarding school in Oxford because my sister was at the university there. That's where I met the class system, because I went to what in those days were direct grant schools. Some of you might remember them. So half the girls came from um, the, uh, Cowley, from the, uh, the motor works, Morris Motors in those days in Cowley. The other half were middle-class children of, profession, of the academics. And they just didn't talk to each other. It was quite extraordinary. It's my really, you know, age 13. And there was I, the sort of outsider that didn't fit into either. But I hated the class system. So the mixture of my background as an immigrant and always that feeling of an outsider, plus this absolutely having the class system in your face as a young girl at school, really made me determined to... Um, uh, uh, you know, as a, a determined socialist. And the interesting is, I'm sure we'll talk about it later, is all that background at that time, the Labour Party was the natural home for everybody who came in from, um, uh, with that sort of immigrant background, because it was the party that promoted equality, equal rights, that it was international, that it, um, um, uh, you know, it, it, it fought for, for minorities, all those values. So when Gordon Brown made his very impassioned speech recently about anti-Semitism and talked about the soul of the Labour Party, I felt a real affinity to every single word that he spoke. Mm -hmm. the, the, um, I, I should note, by the way, everybody here over, certainly over my age, uh, over the 50s, uh, will identify with your remarks about porridge and cabbage. So that was <laughs> more than fruitcake. But just going into politics then, so, so what took you... What, what made you, because it's quite a step. I mean, you, you're, uh, you had a career as an economist and you bring up a family. What, what made you decide that politics was for you, elected politics? Um, well, 
I didn't, I know, I was no, I've always been active, so you said I, I joined CND, I was anti-apartheid, I was anti-Vietnam, all those things that people of my generation took part in were, were part of my teenage years. I was a terrible student at LSE, but had a fantastic time. Um, but uh, but um, what happened was I, I have got four languages, part of my um, background, so I speak fluent French, German, Italian. Um, from the age of under five, it tells you something about how we should be teaching our children. So um, my job, my full-time job involved, I was doing international research. And when I had my first child, it became impossible to do that. This is a terribly funny story as well, but so I couldn't travel. You, in those days, um, women did work, but we didn't sort of, we felt we had to stay at home for the first three or five years of the child's life. And I really wanted babies. I really wanted to be a mum, but I was six weeks at home with the first one. And I have had four, and I've got 12 wonderful grandchildren. But uh, with the first one, I realized that I burst into floods of tears, really. I thought, I can't bear this, getting the boob out and just giving milk, and no reason to getting dressed in the morning. And a friend of mine was um, Caldor's daughter, um, who, um, who was the economist who supported Harold Wilson. And we were both in the Labour Party. And she said, to, and she was the councillor on Islington Council, and I was pregnant with number two. And she said to me, she had to leave. She moved to Birmingham. She said, "Try and get my seat, Margaret, because it'll keep you, going on the council. Will keep you sane whilst you're changing nappies." So it was a rather ridiculous yes, reason to put me into politics. But it is. A I've sort never of heard anybody going in a council <laughs> to keep them sane. That's <laughs> well, yeah, it is a sort of drug. It is a sort of drug. I think you go in because you want to change the world. I think that, you know, we all want to leave the world a better place than we found it. And um, it's a sort of, I, I try to give it up. You said I spent two years, when Labour lost the election in 1992, which was the fourth general election we'd lost, I thought, I've had it, that's enough. Uh, and so I thought, I, I really wanted to go and rather than run a, a big, um, a, an NGO or something, but I thought I'd have, a, a, I was seen as very loony left, so to establish my credibility, I thought I'd do a couple of years as a consultant. You, you had, you see in your book, you had done things like banned fox hunting on the E1, so well, that was... Loony left, it's quite, it's, so I've lived through the 80s, so mm. all the people who are now at the top of the Labour Party, I have to say, I fought in the 1980s, which is why there might be a little bit of tension between me and uh, some of the characters that are now um, uh, in leadership positions of the Labour Party. So the 1980, but it also gives me some empathy to know to what's going on. It's interesting. Those of you that remember those times, I mean, I remember 79 and, and coming out and feeling a huge scent of being let down by the Labour government, you know, the winter of discontent. So I can feel the empathy of all those young people who join Momentum. And in a way, that's the energy of young people coming into politics, I think is a force for good, and we should celebrate that. It's the old trots who've been around since the night that I could do without at the moment, really, is the honest truth. Um, but, uh, and we did, we were there, and we did in, in those early days, you know, we did sort of dominate the party. We, I became leader of a council in 82. Uh, I, was, I was young, I was still young to do that. And we were radical, so we did stuff then. But we were in London, and every journalist in Fleet Street, as far as I could tell, lived north of King's Cross in the London borough of Islington. And they'd drink in the pubs, and they'd sort of make up stories about what we did. So whilst we did really good radical things that have become conventional, so let me give you examples. We established the very first workplace nursery in about 1984, 85, and that was seen as an absolute appalling waste of taxpayers' money. And of course, it's now completely conventional. We established the monitoring of the allocation of council housing, because we were sure that there was discrimina discrimination against people on, on the grounds of eth ethnicity. And that, again, was seen as, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, got, uh, us going at completely mad and left, loony lefty stuff to do. And again, that is completely accepted orthodoxy today. But we did do some mad things. We did do some mad things. So we you know, banned nuclear weapons from the London Borough of Islington. That was a great mad. <laughs> and the funniest thing was animal rights was a big issue in those days. So we banned fox hunting off the A1. <laughs> 
<laughs> and there weren't any urban foxes in those days. But we also, because we got that reputation, and because in the same way as the media is attacking the left now, they were attacking us in those days, they invented stories. So one of the worst ones they invented was that um, it, they invented that we banned Bar Bar Black Sheep from our nurseries, which is complete rubbish. Um, but it was sort of, you know, political correctness gone mad, was what they said. But the terrible truth about that is they wrote it up in the sun, and I can't remember, probably Evening Standard in the sun. And our nursery workers read it, and they thought it was true. So they then went into work and stopped the children singing Bar Bar, their favourite <laughs> nursery around Bar Bar Black Sheep. So it was a difficult time to go through. Mm. But when I reflect on today, the lessons I learned from the 80s were that actually you don't win elections by posturing and passing resolutions in even in beautiful chambers like this. Mm. You win elections by actually listening to people, acting on the things that matter to them, and then delivering on their priorities. And that's what I'm afraid, even in the, the Labour Party has now become again very inward looking and rather nasty and nasty. Not a, it isn't a new gentler politics, it's a very, um, uh, in my view, it's a very intolerant and aggressive and, and, and belligerent politics. And that's where we are now. And we're inward looking, so control of the party is everything and connection to the people in whose name we say we want power has gone on to the back burner. And that's the sad lesson that we haven't learned. And I think until we go through that phase and come back to it, um, I'm a pessimist about whether or not Labour will ever uh, secure power. And from my constituency, I've got one of the poorest, uh, barking in East London, my constituents are absolutely desperate for a government that will build those public services, which are so essential if we're to provide an equalizing opportunity for every, everybody, not based on who they are, their wealth or their background. Just before we move off that, I mean, you've hinted at this, but you, you were elected, you became leader of the council in Islington in 1982. Jeremy Corbyn became the MP for Islington North in 1983. So, the battles you're playing out now, I imagine you were playing out then as well, is that right? I mean, what, what were relations like between yourself and, and no, Jeremy Corbyn? I mean, Jeremy Corbyn and I, have all, I got to know him in 82, so I'm sort of one of the people who's known him for longest. And the honest truth was, in the 80s, do, you, do some of you remember Chris Smith? Who's actually, he's bought, originally come from Scotland. He was the other MP, so we had two, he, Jeremy was his into North, Chris was his into South. And to be honest, in those very troubled years when we were constantly on the front page of the papers, and it was, it was a difficult time because a lot of it were lies and you were trying to do radical things and there was no, no willingness to listen to the sort of um, rationale for some of the, I think, good radical things that we did. Um, Chris was much more problem to me than Jeremy, so if the council got something wrong or we were on the front page being slagged off, Chris would be in there attacking us. Jeremy, to be fair, never, never did that. But his interests, I would say, in the 80s, was he was more interested in Nicaragua than he was in um, Islington. Uh, and he's always had that foreign policy um, focus uh, to what he's done. And then I have got another, it's a bit of a, so we've always had a pretty civil relationship. And my view of him is a view I've come to very, very recently. Um, um, in relation to anti-Semitism. In fact, down the years, I've defended him. So when people have said to me, Jeremy is anti-Semitic, I've said, no, 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 he's, an, he's, a, he's not, he's an anti-racist. And it's on, only because what has emerged, we might again come to it later, over recent times that I've changed my view on that. But I will say this to him, and it's, it's I, you know, people have to judge whether this is a strength or a weakness. I st stopped being leader in 92, and I became um, the MP for Barking in 94. So I didn't really go back to Islington. And then in about 2013, um, 2014, so it was about 20 years afterwards, I was asked to go back to Islington North to talk about my time as Chair of Public Accounts Committee and uh, my tax justice work. 
And I went, and Jeremy, this was before he'd been elected as our leader, and Jeremy introduced me, and I hadn't heard him speak for 20 years. And what was so striking was the actual words he used and the um, values and policies that he, he, he supported were identical to the stuff he'd said 20 years previously. Now, that can either be seen as a strength of consistency of value, or it can be seen as a stubbornness and failure to respond to changing circumstances whilst maintaining your basic values that are always that, that, that put you on the left or put you on the right. And sadly, I don't think it's a strength. I think it's a weakness not be able to see that the world has changed and how do you adapt what you say and what you do to the changing circumstances while being true to those basic values that make me a socialist and a member of the Labour Party. Now, I suspect when um, the audience wants to ask questions, we might explore some of these issues, particularly in a modern context. But um, you mentioned just there you went back to Islington uh, in, in uh, 2013 to talk about tax justice. So if we just bring us up now to when you joined the Public Accounts Committee. So this is 2010, <coughs> Labour lost the election, and you moved from government to opposition. And at the same time, and I think perhaps just to explain for everybody uh, the, the role of the Public Accounts Commission uh, I Committee. I do a little bit of that. Yes, because, it, because it's, a, it's a committee that's always chaired by the opposition, yeah. but the chair is appointed, or had been. Well, let me just say a little bit, because people think, who, what on earth is this Public Accounts Committee? So it was set up by Gladstone in 1861, when, and it was the, the idea was to oversee, it's, be, it's before all the other select committees, it, which was set up for um, Norman St. John Stevens in the 1970s. Um, it was set up by Gladstone in, in 1861. At that time, public spending by government was £69 million. Today, the Public Accounts Committee oversees about £800 billion. Pounds, billion pounds. It's always chaired by a member of the opposition, um, but that used to be an appointment that was in the gift of the party whips and the party leaders. And we had this very important, I think really transformational change in 2010, where the position became elected. So I was the first woman and the first elected chair to the position. And the reason that's made such a difference is that it means you are completely independent of the party machinery. And that allows you, actually, to leave your crude tribal politics at the committee door and try and build consensus within, uh, within the committee. And, and also, you know, I, I was as critical of Labour as I was of the Conservatives, where I felt it was justified. And that, I think, added strength and credibility uh, to the work uh, that we did. The other thing to say is that it's always Although the chair is a um, member of the opposition, it uh, reflects Parliament. So I had a majority of Conservatives on my committee. But during the five years that we, um, that we uh, sat, we produced 247 reports. Out of those, 246 were completely unanimous, and only one was contentious, and that was on royal, the sale of Royal Mail, and that was just in the run-up to the 2015 election, so it was at a very political moment, but apart from that, it was um, consensus. The other thing to say is you get this fantastic room that goes with the job. Um, on the upper committee to corridor in the Palace of Westminster, looking over the Thames, it's a beautiful Pugin room, and w as you walk in, all the photographs of all my predecessors are all up on one wall. And there are two or three interesting observations. One is Harold Wilson was chair of the Public Accounts Committee, and he chaired it on the way up, you know, before he became Prime Minister. And I couldn't for the life of me work out what on earth was he doing chairing this committee on the way up. And the answer was that um, in his day, backbench opposition MPs didn't have rooms from which to work from. They used to work 
in the corridors in the House of Commons with these old-fashioned Victorian school desks, you know, with the chairs attached to the desk. And the only person to get a room in the whole of the Palace of Westminster was the chair of the Public Accounts Committee. So he simply took the job to get the room. <laughs> I also discovered that there were three of my predecessors who'd been to prison, and they were all Labour MPs. Uh, but actually, they'd gone to prison for good reasons. Two of them were um, pacifists, and one had supported the suffragette movement. And I also discovered that more people had been murdered who'd been chairs of public accounts committee than there ever had been uh, prime ministers. Um, so um, uh, um, I was really, I keep wondering, looking at my shoulder to see whether Google's gonna have a little pop at me, yeah. but they've left me alone so far. The other thing to say is our powers aren't very much. I, I think it's worth saying all this, don't shut me up if you think it. Um, um, our powers aren't very great. So we just get these reports which are prepared by the National Audit Office. The good thing about that is that it's information that nobody can challenge. So again, that helps break down the partisan sort of nature. You know, if you've got the evidence, you've got to go where the evidence takes you. And I think everybody respected that. But we can ask people to come and give evidence to us. And then we base our findings on uh, whether or not they do. And I, so, you ask people, you write to people saying, please, would you like come, come, come to a session? And of course, they all look forward to having a session with me shouting at them. And um, I used to get worried. What, so if they turned on your invitation, what I would then do is I'd get a bit of paper, A4 paper like that with my name on the top, and I'd send them a rather more instructive letter saying, we would really expect you to come and give evidence to us. And I was a bit worried about what was my power if they turned that invitation down. And the only ultimate power was that I could have taken it to the floor of the house and the offending individual who refused to come could then be put for a period of reflection in a little prison in the tower of Big Ben. <laughs> I never had to use that. But um, what is interesting is I had really, and this is my, I'll shut up after this, the committee was full of people really across the political spectrum. So do some of you remember Austin Mitchell, the old lefty from Grimsley, who I love, and who's got a really fantastic sense of humor. But by the time he was on the committee, he was pretty deaf as well, but he still was very, very funny. I had him on the one slide. And Stuart Jackson, do you remember him from Peterborough, who ran David Davis's private office for a little bit when David Davis was Brexit secretary, he lost his seat in Peterborough. And he's anti-immigration, anti-Europe, anti-abortion, anti-gay marriage, anti-absolutely everything. Actually, the only thing he and Austin agreed about was Europe. They were both, both Brexiteers. But despite that disparity of political values, we managed to build unanimity. And I think it's a really interesting reflection. And it's about value for money, because I think you know, if you're on the right, you want value for money because you want to cut taxes and you want to cut spending, so it's really important that you get best value out of every pound that you spend. And if you're on the left, as I am, I think public expenditure is the key to unlocking human potential and creating equality. So I want to prove to all of you as taxpayers that I can be trusted with your money and therefore, I want to prove value for money. So whether you're on the, right, on the right or on the left, you both seek value for money. And it was that common purpose that enabled us to build unanimity on what were often very hard-hitting reports. Mm -hmm. Now, can I, I'll bring in a couple of these, if I may. And again, just signal if you want to come in on, on any of these points at the moment. Because tax dominated, I think, your agenda um, yeah. these five years. And you... You discover, uh, there are several cases in your book that you talk about. Yeah. Um, I won't go through them all, but the, um, HSBC, uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, also the big um, global ma multinationals, uh, Google, uh, Amazon, uh, Starbucks, others, and so on. Um, Goldman Sachs, for example, why did, why did they attract your attention? Why did you end up having uh, dealings with them? Again, this is a story, because it all started with Goldman Sachs. Mm -hmm. um, when I became, when I was first elected, again, David Davis had been chair of the Public Accounts Committee when Labour was in government. 
and he was a backbencher at that point, and he came up to me and he said, um, I'll help you with everything I can. And he did, down the years, he really did support me when I sort of wasn't quite sure how to tackle it, something. And then he pointed his finger at me and he said, Vodafone, Margaret, you've got to go after Vodafone and their tax affairs. And I sort of looked at him and I couldn't work him out in my brain how the private affairs of a multinational company, tax affairs, had anything to do with a, a parliamentary committee that was tasked with looking after public expenditure. But actually, it didn't take long for me to realize that how good or not we are at collecting taxes goes to the heart of the efficiency of HMRC. And the gap between what we should collect and what we do collect is ginormous. HMRC reckon it's about 34, 35, 36 billion pound, billion pound, that gap. And despite everything that they've tried, it's still, it, it hovers around that level. Tax campaign has put it at 120 billion. So whether you settle at a figure at the middle, let's say, you know, we'll, we'll never agree, till 70 billion a year that we don't get, that is, just think what that means in terms of what we could do for our schools and our hospitals and, you know, elderly people in the community, all that stuff. So it's massive. And, that, and, I, and I got that. And then what happened is we, we used to have these regular sessions with HMRC where they'd come to set, and we'd hold them to account for how well or badly they'd been doing. And we'd get a brief that thick from, um, uh, from the National Audit Office the night before. And I read it before they came, but I also happened to be read that day, Private Eye. And Private Eye was running a story about a sweetheart deal that the tax authorities had reached with Goldman Sachs. So we get to the session, and the head of tax is sitting there, and I ask him questions about Goldman Sachs. And he avoids answering the questions, hiding behind the privacy of um, individual tax affairs. You can't, it, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a confidentiality of tax affairs for the individual. But he did say, and he was also questioned on this, because other people read uh, Private Eye too, he was questioned by Jesse Norman in the Treasury Select Committee on the same issue. And he actually said to Jesse Norman, I had nothing to do with the Goldman Sachs deal. It was a very frustrating session. We got absolutely nowhere. And at the end of it, I thought, well, I haven't done very well here. And then I got a big brown envelope. And it was really thick. And I was really working 24-7. And I thought, I'm never going to get through this. But my clerk said, have a look at it. So I did that weekend. And there was one sheet of paper in there. And that was the uh, minutes of a meeting that had been held by the head of law in HMRC on the Goldman Sachs deal. And the head of law said there were two things in that minute. It was literally one sheet. One, that the head of tax had shaken hands on the deal. So he had been economical with the truth to a, a parliamentary select committee, which is really naughty to, to, thing to do. And the head of law thought the deal was, quotes, unconscionable. So that's pretty hard stuff. So we decided to call the head of tax back and he obfuscated and he avoided and he hid behind um, uh, confidentiality of taxpayers' interest. So we then called in the head of law and all we wanted him to do was to confirm the veracity of the minute. That's all we wanted. And he was com you know, babbling away at the end of the committee table, telling us nothing. And sitting next to me was my in effect vice chair, who is a, con a conservative MP for Norfolk, who'd been on the committee for 10 years. I'd been doing it for about six months by then. And he whispered to me, put him on oath, Margaret. That might get something out of him. And I said, I can't put him on oath. He said, yes, you can. He was babbling away down the other end. So I turned to the clerk and I said, can I put him on oath? And he said, yes, you can. So I said, well, go and find a Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and it took him 20 minutes to find a Bible in the House of Commons. And we found, we found a Bible. We put this poor bugger on oath. And it absolutely petrified him. Didn't get much more out of him, but it hit the six o'clock news on the telly. Mm -hmm. And that put us up to the top. And actually, the good thing out of it is it made, 
um, HM, the head of tax left, his, left the job a few weeks later. And they changed the process of how they agreed and had settled their internal procedures. But what it also did was it brought a journalist to me who then talked to me about Starbucks. And that started me on the road. And all the way through, this is what's so interesting, I'm but probably the only person in the Palace of Westminster who's got a good voice word to say about journalists. Where you get good investigative journalists, they are completely and utterly brilliant. And you see that in the pa Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers, and actually you see what happened with the Maltese journalist. Uh, yeah, it was more. Uh, yeah, I'm right. On, no, it wasn't. It was the one who got killed recently because she was off, was Malta, wasn't it? But you can see it all over the place. Or the guy now who's just the uh, uh, um, the guy, the, Tur the, Tur the Turks are out, the Saudi Arabian. Khashoggi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All Khashoggi. that stuff. These are where you get investigative, committed journalists. They're wonderful. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is whistleblowers. So on Google, on, on HMRC, on actually, again, the people who have revealed um, HSBC mm -hmm. and the ones who gave the evidence. I'm a huge supporter and we don't do enough. We never do enough both to pr certainly to protect whistleblowers mm. and indeed to protect mm -hmm. um, the backs of investigative journalists. Mm. What's interesting there is that, you, you, well, a number of points that are interesting, but the, so it started off um, with private eye catching attention, and then a whistleblower providing you with this brown envelope of um, the minutes of meetings that the, the official had denied happened, occur, occurred. Um, and then it was followed up by investigative journalists. I, I, I would imagine that, certainly I would imagine most people who are unfamiliar with Parliament would think, well, why would Parliament have to rely on those sources? Do we not have, you know, particularly a committee like yours, isn't that, the, isn't that exactly what the National Audit Office should be doing? Isn't, that, isn't it their job to get to the bottom of these matters? They're giving you the official report, the official audited accounts on which you then investigate these matters. And you've got all the resources of Parliament at your disposal you know, why should someone like you be in that situation, and all your colleagues, be relying on these very unofficial and, you know, um, and in some cases, uh, slightly dangerous sources of information? Your whistleblowers will get prosecuted and lose their job if they're not careful. Yeah, I mean, to be, you know, what one of the saddest things for me, <coughs> sorry, a terrible cold, but was that the whistleblower who gave me those papers from Goldman Sachs was a lawyer in HMRC. And I really worked hard to protect him. But um, the, the head of HMRC uh, went into his computer, went into his phone, made his life so intolerable that in the end, he, I, I couldn't defend him. Every time she came up, say, how are you treating him? And in the end, it made his life so intolerable that he left. So I feel, although we've got a legislative framework, once you're a whistleblower, the workplace can make your life so intolerable. It's very difficult to really properly defend you. That's the first thing. The second thing is the National Audit Office. Um, I mean, I had a sort of difficult relationship in the end, but in the, in the beginning, but in the end, we had a really good relationship. Their job's different. That's why we matter as politicians, actually. Because what I felt very much, and it came out of my experience in fighting the BMP and Barking, it taught, what that experience taught me was it's so easy to lose connection with the people. You know, there I was in a safe Labour seat. Joe Richardson had been my predecessor, you know, used to weigh the votes and you wouldn't even bother to count them. And the Labour Party was inward looking. I, I know this resonates in Scotland because we see what it ended up with in Scotland. It you know, was inward looking. Nobody really thought about connecting. And it, and the way we won back for Labour in Barking, and I'm now, again, one of the safest Labour seats, was I completely changed the way I do my politics there. So everything I do is about how can I reconnect with, uh, with the people who put me there. And that knowledge, I can babble on about yeah. it forever, but that knowledge was what, you know, in 2010, when I arrived in that job, took, I took with me. So I sort of was always asking the questions that I thought the good people of Barking Dagenham would want me to ask. It was very much based in that. And that's a different set of questions to what auditors, bless them, you know, their cotton socks, would, would be asking. So working together worked well. 
So for example, on Google, if I take that as an example, I was inundated with whistleblowers from Google. Mm -hmm. But actually, what we did is we selected a few of them, and then I met them together with the controller and auditor general. And we had one guy, this was extraordinary, one guy who had worked for Google for 10 years. And when he left, he downloaded all his stuff on, on, all his stuff on a computer. So while Google was saying they weren't selling anything in the UK, they were just selling into the UK, which is how they were avoiding tax. We had this massive, absolute bundle of evidence which showed them signing contracts, even sending out invoices from UK offices. And the other guy was also a Google employee who gave us his, um, his uh, um, wage slips. And it was, uh, and about a quarter of his wage was his basic wage. And the rest was um, uh, money that he earned from the business he brought in by selling Google services. So it was a, set, it was a complete clear. And that, I, so there was a good working together. But, you know, and, and the final observation, there are people who got their hands up. The final observations I had is during our time in the PAC, we went to visit America to see how they did it there. And the, U and the American equivalent to us, um, they have 120 people supporting them, 80 uh, people supporting the majority party, 40 the minority party. And what really strikes you there is they're completely, utterly, totally partisan. So they never come out with agreed reports. And I think they're weaker. And in a way, because we were so badly resourced, so we were, you know, I mean, I had so many whistleblowers on the private sector delivering public services that really enabled us to throw open scandals and lies of, pub, of, of many of these pub, private contractors involved in, in public service delivery all whistleblowers. Um, I think the way we ran it, in a way, it's sort of muddling through, and it was a little bit by the, you know, we were on thin ice quite often, but it actually enabled us to build that consensus and engage in a way that was not, contra it wasn't partisan, it just wasn't partisan. Mm. And, I, and that was really our strength, I think. No, I can imagine, and uh, just catch my eye if there are hands up. Oh, there's one right there, yes. Uh, just wait two seconds. A microphone will make its way down to you. Back cold, so I can't back hear very well. Those. Can, I, can I ask a question while we're waiting for the <coughs> microphone? And that is, um, I mean, I would, I would have thought across the political spectrum, all politicians want everybody to pay their taxes fairly. People, the rich, the poor, big companies, small companies, and it's, it strikes everybody as unfair that the bigger you are, the more you should get away with. You could get away with it. Now, I understand that you did achieve consensus most of the time. There's a couple of times I think you indicated you didn't. That One of the times you got the whistleblowers together to give evidence, and then your committee rebelled on you and wouldn't allow it, and you had to have a private session. Is that right? Oh, well, th that wasn't on tax. On tax, we did always con receive consensus. And, <coughs> and one of the things I was, I was going to say is I've carried that on since 2015. Well, yes, you've been successful. In so we've got... A, one of the things I'm really proud of is I now run an all-party group on what we call responsible tax. I'll just talk about that a little bit. Um, where So we've been ca campaigning. My latest bestest friend is one Andrew Mitchell, who's a Conservative MP. And, but famous. he was the... Yeah. Oh yeah, and he, but he's interested. He's been really brilliant on overseas development. And what, one of the things I learned through all my tax work is that transparency is absolutely key the more you can open things to public account, the more you stop wickedness happening. And if you look at the Panama Papers, for example, half of the entities that were cited in the Panama Papers were companies that had been established in a British overseas territory, the uh, British Virgin Isles. So if we can open to public account who owns what and how the money flows in the overseas territories, that will, it won't, it's not, a, it'd be a thing that can lance a lot of, not just tax avoidance, but also money laundering and terrible financial crime. Um, you know, if we can do that, we set out to do it. And we achieved that. We achieved that last year, working with Andrew Mitchell. And I saw 40 conservatives on a one-to-one -one basis and I tell you, every time before one came in, I'd look at their CV 
So one of the, one of the, as I'll tell you, this one came in and he said, sat down, and I was already working on the anti-Semitism stuff then, and he sort of had an affinity with me over that, and then he said to me, Margaret, I would like to see open registers of beneficial ownership in the overseas territories, but I've got to tell you something. I know a very lot of very rich people. So I thought, mm -mm, what's coming now? And he said, and the trouble is, they don't want to tell their wives about how much money they've got. <laughs> that was terrible. And then I had this other guy who came in, who I looked at his CV and I thought, blimey, what have I got in common with him? He was very anti-immigration, really, really anti any gay rights and all that, horribly anti-abortion, all these things that I care about. But I just spotted one thing. He was also virulently opposed to Russia. So we had all this stuff on Russian dirty money, on the Russians sort of, I mean, using. They, they used our overseas territories, our tax havens, and the financial services sector in the city to get their money, not just the Russians. I mean, it's sort of also places like you saw uh, Azerbaijan this week. In, in the woman yesterday with the, uh, uh, being named as somebody who's used that. And this is the woman who spent 15 million in Harrods. 20, 15 20 million, million in Harrods, 20 million on her home. Wow. You know, absolutely awful. But and Nigeria, I mean, you get it from bits of Africa, you get it from the Middle East, you get it from everywhere. But our, our, I was able to convince him, because of the Russian dirty money, to support our amendment. Mm. So again, People from completely different political stables building consensus, and we won. We forced the government. It was very funny. This, the government didn't want. This was actually a Boris Johnson bill, and we put down our amendment, Andrew Mitchell and I, and we got we got absolutely Ken Clark supported us, Nikki Morgan supported us. We had a lot of big big names supporting us on the top, and of course everybody on the Labour side was supporting us. Although I'm not the Labour's, I'm not Labour's favourite person, but we had to make sure everybody was there to vote on the day. So actually, Andrew Mitchell went in to see my chief whip, who I'm not that his favourite because I always vote, I don't always vote the Labour line on Europe because I'm a very um, strong European. So I'm voting everything that keeps us as close to Europe as we can. So the EEA, I voted for that against the Labour whip. So, but he went in and he said to the chief whip, you dare have one Labour vote not here on the day we have this amendment and I'll make sure Labour takes the blame for losing it. So we had a very strong Labour uh, three-line whip. Mm. And the speaker, bless him. He's whipping the whip. No, he's whipping the whip. He was the chief whip on the Tory side, so they knew each other. Mm. But I had had the Tory persuade the Labour whip that it was a good idea. And the chief, uh, and then the, uh, um, uh, the speaker helped us, and he does help backbenchers. He's a really, really good chief whip, uh, speaker, took our amendment. But as I walked into the chamber, I thought we had 40 votes. I thought we had a win, but you can never tell. You know, you can never tell whether people are actually going to go through the, the lobby with you. And as I walked into the chamber, the minister. Boris was one of Boris Johnson's juniors, Alan Duncan. I happened to bump into him, and he said, we're having a fight this afternoon. I said, yeah, I know, and um, went and sat down. And then Andrew Mitchell, so we're both sides of the chamber. Andrew Mitchell was up on the other side of the chamber, and so we acknowledged each other. And then I saw the Tory chief whip run up to him. I thought, what the hell is he talking to him about? And then he came down again. And Alan Duncan at the moment was on his feet saying what a terrible amendment and how if we had transparency in the overseas territories, this would completely destroy the economy of the, of the British Virgin Isles. I'll come back to that, didn't, doesn't, but and all these, all these places. And then he came down again and Alan Duncan banged on about what a terrible amendment it was. Then he went back up again and I thought something's happening. And then Andrew Mitchell pointed to me, put your phone on because you put your phone off when you get into the, into the chamber. So I did put my phone on, and he, he texted me, and he said, I think they're going to cave in. And two seconds later, having slagged us off about how terrible our amendment is, Alan Duncan said, but we're going to concede it. <laughs> <laughs> you won the vote, that's a big thing there. So the, somebody's got the microphone. The person with the microphone first, yes. Um, I'm Margaret, I'm Councillor Tim Brett. I chair the scrutiny committee on Fife Council. Could you give me some advice from your experience of being a councillor 
as well as the Public Accounts Committee, as to how I should do that? Um, well, I think it's what any try and work across the parties. Are you 100% late? What are you? Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would urge building consensus, trying to leave the tribal politics at the door. So you've got to work hard at that. I mean, I often people ask, say to me, how did you do it? So I often say, running Islington Council when we had 52 Labour councillors um, taught me lots of lessons about building consensus because you get all your splits within the Labour within the Labour group. So. You know, I did build consent. I think being a woman helped. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you know, I was, all, I was able to say sorry in a way that sometimes meant, you know, so every time when they did get cross from me every now and then, I'd say, I'm terribly sorry I got things wrong. It didn't really matter because I got what I wanted anyway. So <laughs> saying sorry. <coughs> saying sorry. So I think that's important. I think asking the questions your constituents want. And I didn't take the agenda that the audit, that was the other thing I probably should say. So the National Audit Office has a program of work, but if something came up, you know, like the tax issue, but it wasn't just the tax issue, other issues would come up. You know, we looked at, you know, something would come up in the press and you just think, goodness, we ought to be looking at that issue. So to grab it and go with it so that you're really, the work you do relates to the people who elected you. Um, and I think do, change who you get evidence from. So that we used to have people in, you know, they, they tend to, I mean, I, in your council would be departmental heads or whatever. So go down a little bit, get the voluntary sector in giving evidence, get campaigning groups in giving evidence, all that sort of stuff. I think, you know, so it's how you do it and uh, all that helps. And I didn't set out to do this. I honestly didn't. But I, I tell you, it's sort of my, all my social, e social media sort of um, stuff and everything, people just really appreciate it. They do like it. They really like you to do that. And it's a really good way of reconnecting pos you know, where, where party politics is. Yes, the, the lady with the microphone just there. With your public accounts committee, um, I read your book and it's amazing to me that HMRC can, can be so obfuscating when they're... Tax, they're paid by the taxpayer, they're civil servants, you're elected, surely you're more powerful than they are. Um, and then people come to the committees, private sector people like the Facebook guy, and they're able to just get away with saying nothing. So it, it seems like our elected representatives don't have any power. So is there any push within the House of Commons to get more power to these committees? You know, this, it's a very good question. It's a very difficult question, and I don't think there's an, a, a, an obvious answer. What I do think is we ought to have the right to access papers more than we do. So we looked at the... Air, I mean, it's a different story, but we looked at the aircraft carriers. Now, that was a Gordon Brown initiative. And um, he... It was, you know, 2006, 2007... And it was around the jobs in the in the in, in the in the shipyard. Really, it was it was taken for industrial. The decision to build the aircraft carrier it was an industrial decision. It wasn't really a defence decision, and it was taken <coughs> without any um, anybody really looking at the defence budget, which was completely ridiculously overspent. And they signed the contract, and of course, it was much more than the original thing. And they found within six months of signing the contract that they didn't have the money to pay. So they paused the contract. But they'd employed everybody up here in Scotland and down in, in uh, Plymouth and actually also um, in, uh, um, uh, in the Lake District. You know, they'd, in all the, they, so they've got people in the shipyards all over the place. They, they, signed, they had to keep the people there. So just pausing that contract for 18 months, which is what they did because they didn't have the money, cost us all as taxpayers 1.6 billion pounds. Lot, you know, 1.6 simply for an outrageously bad decision. And then the Tories came in, the coalition came in, and so they, again, 
wanted to change their minds. Complete ridiculous, and they wanted to use a different aircraft, aeroplane coming off it. Um, so instead of using, uh, they had to, I can't remember now the details, it was, they, they had to change the surface, the deck, to take the different sort of aeroplane. And they took that decision without looking at the technical feasibility or the costs. They just took it because it was against what Labour had done. So both parties, bad as each other. And we wanted the papers. We wanted to look at the papers that had gone before those who had taken that position to see what information they'd had, which had informed, had they had the proper technical and financial information before they'd taken the decision. And they refused to release the papers. And I think that's bad. So I would go, and it's the same on tax. Every Google, today, for the life of me, I think the stuff we gave them from our whistleblowers meant that Google should have been in court because I think they lied about their model, their financial model. I don't think, I think they, I, I know that they sell in the UK. However much they say, we don't, we sell, uh, we, we sell from Ireland. They don't, they sell in the UK. They've never been taken, they've never been taken to court. We've never seen the papers, you know, they, they did this deal, this 130 million deal. Do you remember George Osborne announced it from Switzerland? It was a 10 year deal. Uh, although I have to say in one year, the head of Google earned 74 million, which is more than half of what they paid the UK in tax over, te over 10 years, outrageous. We ought to see those papers. So, you know, these are publicly quoted companies, I think. So I think access to papers would help. Now, the other argument is, should, we, should they, should they well, go why, under... Why oath? aren't the MPs pushing for that? Why aren't they demanding more power over... Power. Well, the, other, the, the argument, then, is should you, have, should you get evidence on oath? That's the argument, really, so that they can't obfuscate. And the argument, and that's the difficult argument, because, for me, the argument against that is the moment you introduce oath and lawyers, you make it a much more formal um, uh, event. And then I think, Pete, you know, one of the advantages of not having them on oath, the disadvantage, you've got to really push hard to get stuff out of them, the obfuscation. But you do have more of a conversation, and you might get more out of the conversation than you would if you created a court of law. So it's, I don't know, you know, you, it's the talent of, you know, can you get the stuff out of them? Can you get, which is why the whistleblowers and the journalists matter so much. So have you got, I'm not answering it, I'm not giving you a, a full answer because I haven't I suppose got the, it. The, the difficulty is that the, the job of the committee, I mean, it's not a court, it's, it shines a light and it certainly attracts mm -hmm. attention. Mm -hmm. uh, but it must be frustration, I mean, the frustration that the lady there is mm -hmm. expressing. Um, this week, I'm sure it wouldn't have escaped your notice that yesterday um, it was declared that Cadbury's managed to pay no tax on 175, 185 million pound uh, profit. Uh, earlier in the week, Facebook yet again said that they were paying seven and a half million pounds tax on a turnover of something like 1.2 billion. Less, it's less than half of 1%. Uh, it, it's un and so uh, I think most of us <coughs> as citizens, never mind as elected representatives, are offended by that. But surely it's then, that's a sign of failure because you know for five years you were shining a light on this and you can, you can ask companies to take a moral stance, but in the end, they have to follow the law, so surely we need to change the law to make sure they pay their tax fairly. Yeah, so, um, uh, which is why I've set up, I, you know, I think we start, before. this is what, I, I think what we achieved was shining a light. We mm -hmm. didn't achieve the changes we wanted. And one of the important changes is the one last year about transparency in the, in the tax havens. But, we have got to change the law. And the difficulty is that these are all global companies. So, uh, and we think companies work in sort of national jurisdictions. They don't anymore, none of these companies. National jurisdictions are irrelevant. So you do need to find a global solution. And the problem with, you know, basically Cadbury's or Facebook or Google or any of these should have one set of accounts, one set of accounts that are verified by one jurisdiction and then the profits are divided up according to uh, where they make uh, the taxes determined according to the profits, which are divided up on 
could be on turnover, it could be on the number of people they employ, it could be on capital employed, it could be all sorts of criteria to decide your activity up. Now to get there, you need global consensus. And that is absolutely, it'll take us a generation to get there. So let's fight for that and keep fighting for that. And one of the arguments we had from the tax havens were, oh, we'll be transparent when everybody else is transparent. So we said, we've got to lead the way. Mm -hmm. But on, we could do more in the UK. And I'll, I'll give you about four. I've got loads of ideas, but I'll give you four. One, we could say that the FTSE top 100 companies, who are publicly quoted companies, that we ought to see the workings of how they get to their deals with HMRC. And I don't think the world would fall apart. And I don't think they'd pull out of the UK because we're far too an import, important a, a market for them. And then if the world doesn't fall apart, we might think of having greater transparency in wider tax affairs, particularly of companies. I can see the difference between co companies and trusts and not individuals. That's one thing you could do. If that's completely and totally unpalatable, what might be our next campaign in the all-party group is we have a a joint committee of both part, of both houses at the moment that oversees the security services. So they meet in secret, but they do get access to all the data. So there is some sort of accountability built in there, and they do produce reports. So why shouldn't we have a joint committee of both houses of parliament that oversees HMRC? HMRC is a non-ministerial department the minister doesn't even oversee it. So there is absolutely no accountability for them doing the sweetheart deals, which we all think they do. They deny they do, but we none of us know the answer. And I think that could be another way mm -hmm. of, trying to, uh, uh, of trying to get. And then the third thing, there are all sorts of things I do. Uh, if somebody like, I mean, Facebook is a bad example, but if some of these big companies, some of these big IT companies, who also pay less than 1% of their tax. Why on earth are we giving them public contracts? You know, what on earth are we doing using taxpayers' money to give contracts to private companies who refuse to pay their fair share of tax on any common sense view of what that should be? So I think we should use our power in public procurement to force a more responsible attitude. And then my final idea, because I don't want to go on, mm -hmm is these companies don't dream these schemes up in the, by themselves in the middle of the night. There are a absolute army of very, very, very well-paid um, accountants, lawyers, banks, who spend their time finding loopholes in the tax system, but they're never held to account for doing so. So even if 15 years down the line, HMRC will find that a loophole hasn't worked. Film tax credit, has some of you picked up on that, where some of the big, you know, lots of greedy individuals bought into this film tax credit tax scam, and they're now having to pay thousands back. Footballers, TV personalities, everybody went in for that. But the guy who invented the scheme is at the moment getting away scot-free, and I think we should make the advisors accountable for the schemes they devise. And I think, again, that would very quickly smell out those ones that are really not um, a, a, a pushing the law. I mean, if we could, we are the lawmakers. I'm a lawmaker. Don't, you know, and all these schemes, all these avoidance, we didn't set up a scheme that allowed, that intended Google to avoid tax or Facebook or Cadbury or whoever. We didn't do that. So they're not meeting the intent of Parliament. But the very people who help us ride the technical rules, then become the very people who advise these big companies or these very rich individuals how to avoid the rules, how to avoid paying their tax. Right, there's a number of hands going up here. The gentleman here first and then me. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, going back to um, Barking and beating um, Nick Griffin, you talked about connecting back with the electorate. Obviously, now the, the rise of the far right is quite different, and um, from Trump to the disgusting attacks that we're seeing, increasing attacks in Edinburgh, like the one in um, Leaf Sikh Temple, um, what advice have you got from your campaign against Nick Griffin, and, and what advice have you got in general for anti-fascists and the, the movement today? 
anti-fascists. Anti 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 well, I don't think. I, mean, I think what I, I, th I think, I spend my time proselytizing about what we did, because I think it works, and I, I don't think. It, so what, what we've just done is literally everything I do as an MP, is about does it help me to reconnect with local people? It has to pass. So I don't spend my time at Labour Party meetings. I don't spend my time with Labour Party councillors. I mean, I get on really well. I mean, it's not that I've got a bad relationship with them. It's not that my party is trying to deselect me or anything like that. But I just, it's not, I am into how do you reconnect. So you look at, and I've got a string of ways. And in fact, if you'll give me five minutes on this, you know, mm. and I've, I've picked them up from other people and we develop them. So perhaps the best, you know, I do street meetings, I do campaigns, but I do coffee afternoons. Let me describe those to you. So in 2006, we had 12 BNP councillors. And if we hadn't, took us from 2006 to 2010 to defeat the extreme the far right. And if we hadn't had that four years of work and we weren't continuing it, I, I know in 2000, I'd have lost to Nick Griffin. I I'm absolutely know it in my heart. So it was the work we did that transformed it. So I would ask a 1,000 people to come have a cup of tea with me. And they're people who have voted, so it's pretty targeted stuff. So, uh, uh, and um, they'll come, probably 50 to 70 show, but I've written to a 1,000 people. And we'll sit around the table, little tables, and I'll offer them a cup of tea and a good chocolate biscuit. Um, and then I go table to table. And I don't talk about your, I don't talk about Brexit, I don't talk about universal credit or whatever's the latest thing that, you know, activists are, and, and MPs are worrying about. I say, what's bugging you? And people's politics is very local. People's politics start from the local. So it will be local issues, whether it's a bit of antisocial behavior or a road scheme or whatever, whatever, whatever. It will be those sort of things that, um, and it'll be national issues that hit them locally. So for me, immigration, you know, I moved from, when I arrived, it was a completely white borough. And within a generation, it's now become as multicultural as any part of London. So it's been a real transformation. That's one of the reasons that scapegoating immigrants became a very easy thing for the far right to do. So they will talk, and then we'll come together after I've done an hour, and we'll talk again. And I'm going to give you one example at the end, but I'll just talk to you the process through. And there's always a local issue that comes up, so it'll be a rat run or something. So I'll talk about the local issue. I'll talk about immigration. I'll talk about Europe, if that's the issue. I'll talk about benefits, whatever it is. Then I go away and I write to a 1,000 again, saying, thank you for coming for my coffee afternoon. These are the issues we've raised. So I'll write about immigration, and I'll write about the road issue. Then I'll sort out the road, which I can do. And then I'll write a third time and say, you all came, you raised this issue, we've sorted it. I hope it's all right now, let me know if it's not working. So they've heard from me three times. I've listened to what they've said. I've acted where I can, and I've communicated. And that builds trust. It's very simple. It's not rocket science. It's very simple, but it can also be very powerful. And I've got endless stories, but I'll give you one. So I go into this um, uh, coffee afternoon in a really strong BMP area, get up at the end, and um, I can't remember the issue even. I think it was that it was, a, um, that it was a speed, there was a, a road that cars were using as a shortcut. So I started talking about that, and this woman gets up, about 55, 60, and she starts screaming at me, Margaret, you're not talking about what we want to talk about. You've ruined this borough. You've let all these asylum seekers in, and they're jumping the queue in the hospitals, and they're all on the benefits scrounge, and you've ruined the borough. And she sat down. And then I, do, I have a spiel that I gave on migration. It didn't work, and I thought, oh, oh, I'm in for a heavy afternoon. And then a white guy got up in about late 50s, and he said, I've been on benefits for 25 years. Um, I'd love to work, and I can't. I run out of money at the end of every month. Don't call me a scrounger. And he sat down. And then an Afro-Caribbean guy got up, and he said, I've been here for... He was a, a Windrush guy. 
I'd been here for, you know, 30, 40 years, whatever. I brought my children up here. They've both been through university. They, um, I pay my taxes. I'm British. And he sat down. And then two BMP chaps got up. One said, my son's just out of the army and you haven't given the house. You give it to Lithuanians. And I was able to challenge that. And another one got up and said, I've been on the list and you're giving it all to these asylum seekers, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the afternoon, it was quite heavy, I thought I'd better go up to the woman who'd started it all off. So I went up to say, are you all right? And she said, I do want to talk to you, Margaret, but I just want to go and apologize to those two guys. And she went and apologized to the Benefit and the uh, Caribbean. And that's a sort of powerful exchange. It's a powerful exchange that starts sort of, it's very slow, it's not very intellectually challenging, but it is so powerful. So it's sort of listening, acting, communicating. And I never, ever, ever once gave in to racism, ever. Mm. How could I? I'm an immigrant. Yeah. <coughs> Community politics. So there's a gentleman just here, uh, was there not? It was there, yes, there, that gentleman there. And then in a second, I've got one up there. So gentleman here first, yes, just go ahead. Um, no, the, the microphone will come on if you speak, I think. Okay, okay. Um, going back to the Public Accounts Committee, we, we know that our tax system is been developed over decades, but it's based essentially on profits. <coughs> and profits are elusive in themselves. Sorry, I'm missing yeah, The microphone's on now, so try again. Yeah. Okay. Um, going back to the um, raising taxes, uh, our, our tax system is essentially based on profits, and we talk about Google paying X million, that's based on their, their profit base. Yeah. But profits are elusive, they're elusive in themselves, and they're elusive geographically. What work is HMRC doing about looking at alternative ways of taxing these companies? taxing them on transactions, taxing them on clicks, taxing them on deliveries within the UK yeah. as opposed to profit base. If, if, if they won't come clean about their profits, yeah. can we attack them in other ways that may in themselves work or force them to be more open yeah. and realistic about their profits? You're right that all this stuff is about profit shifting. That's what these global companies do. They shift their profits from where they make them to a low tax or a no tax jurisdiction. Um, and actually, I should have said it in answer to, the, to I think, oh, yeah, one of the other questions. The government is trying to do a little bit, and Europe is actually being much better than us. So particularly on the uh, internet-based companies, um, they, we are now looking to do a tax on turnover. I mean, I think the ultimate solution has to be that one jurisdiction has to own that total company and then divvy up the profits according to some criteria. But because that's going to take forever to get to, get the consensus, I think actually what this government, as long as they do it, I mean, they talk with forked tongue. You know, they pretend to be tough and then they don't actually. Then they do the deals and they run away scared. But I think this idea of doing a tax, the Google tax hasn't worked. The Google tax is rubbish. It doesn't touch Google at all. But doing a tax on the revenue that Amazon earn here or that... Um, Google earn here or that Facebook earn here must be the way through and I hope they've got the guts to bring that into legislation mm. uh, um, this time. There's a couple more, um, somebody right up there and uh, hand packled right there as well. Gentleman there. Margaret, the, one of the main reasons I've come here is to thank you for the dignity and the charm you exercised earlier this year in the anti-Semitism that is going through the Labour Party. I have great admiration. Like you, I also suffered from people who died in the Holocaust. However, my question is really, you explained slightly about how you joined the Labour Party, how you came to this country. I was actually born here, but only just. Um, isn't it a more dramatic event in your life that actually fix your political leanings? I almost entirely disagree with you politically, but it is because of something that specifically happened at a particular important age, I was 17 at the time, that have made my political beliefs, which I've studied since, but it was a dramatic event that did it. I have the same sort of feeling with you, that you also suffered from discrimination in your teenage years, and that's what created your political thoughts. I'm not asking for a political answer, I'm asking for a social answer. Thank you. 
Right, just hold on to that for a second. I'm just taking uh, Anne Packard there. Yes, the, the lady just behind you, sorry, sir. During this week, as I understand it, the, one of the regulators has recommended that the big four accountancy firms should not be permitted to continue both to audit and to advise the same clients. That seems to me very good in principle. The practice may be more difficult because how are they then going to carve up the advisory work? Is it going to be simply amongst themselves, again, the big four? Because the professional services, especially in accountancy, sizes five to eight and five to nine don't have the earnings of any one of the big four. So unless there's a massive capacity build in those large but still smaller firms, how is that going to work out? So there are two questions, one about your own personal beliefs and one about the accountancy firms. Um, I mean, I, I completely, I think it's a really important bit of work that they've just embarked on, and I hope, again, that the government's got the guts to see it through. And there are jurisdictions, and I'm sort of smiling, I'm, I'm not, not even, I'm sure somebody in the audience knows, there are people, there are other jurisdictions where it is separated. So we've got models on which we can, we can develop it for us. So I, hopefully we'll get there. Hope, I mean, the big firms, when we looked at the big four, earn two billion pounds a year from tax advice two b in the UK, in the UK. It's a massive, massive industry. But it isn't just them, it is the lawyers. And it is the banks, the banks are very complicit in this, you know. I mean, that was our HSBC inquiry. It was extraordinary, the, the banks, they don't lend money to the little startup company that really could do with it. And they shovel money into film tax, the film tax um, um, uh, uh, scam that people, or um, you know, helping people take their money out of Switzerland and put it into British Virgin Isles. I mean, it is outrageous. So I, have I got the practical answer to you? No, we're looking at it ironically in my, because it's, I, we think it's something that's gonna happen. I think it's gotta happen, but I still think you're gonna have to have offenses. So you make the advisor accountable the advice they give, whether it's within the accountancy form, uh, with it, with it, within a firm that does both accountants, you know, does the figure work and the, the advice, or whether it's separated, because the advice goes beyond that. So I, I think it's a good thing we're doing it. I don't, I think it's necessary, but not sufficient. And on was there a, was there a, I mean, there wasn't a particular, what made me, I don't, there wasn't any, my instinct was all, um, always, Equality drives my beliefs. That's all I can say to you. Equality. And I have to say on the anti sentiment it's the weirdest thing in my life because I have never, I never, ever, ever dreamt that I would, that I would be involved in this issue because I've always been a very secular Jew. I've never, you know, my, my parents were integrated into, into their communities in, in both Germany and Austria. Um, uh, you know, one of the reasons it's so... Um, present for me is that two of my sisters are now going through the letters of my grandparents and my aunts and it's this really really pro and they you know we've uncovered the letter my grandmother who was killed by the Nazis wrote nine days before she died she didn't leave Austria because she thought nobody would touch her because she thought she was too old she was in her mid-50s and uh, she was killed not even in a concentration camp. They killed her in one of those trenches outside the concentration camp. And she wrote a letter to my uncle, my mum's brother, nine days before she died, in which she says, and that must have been a censored letter, in which she says twice, don't forget me completely. And when you uncover that, and you know, and all this is horrible stuff, is you're getting all this anti-Semitic social abuse, which I was, it just, that, that's what drove me to it. But the other thing to say is the reason I wasn't is I am secular, I am not a believer. I've never followed um, um, uh, Jewish traditions, ironically. It's just not been a part of my life. I've, I've had two husbands, neither of whom were Jewish. And I have always been a very, very strong critic of successive Israeli governments for their treatment of Palestinians. Although I do believe it's important to have uh, a state, uh, you know, 
the state of Israel is there, and I think we should support it. But I don't in any way support any of the actions, particularly the most recent, absolutely outrageous act, uh, providing two sort of tiers of citizenship mm. for Jews and non-Jews within the state of Israel. So it's all weird, but I can't tolerate anti-Semitism. Do you think that the, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn's now accepted, and the Labour Party's accepted mm. uh, the international definition of mm. uh, anti-Semitism. Does that draw a line under the matter? Ken Livingston's left the party? No. What, I mean, I think it's a, you know, I don't think we needed this row. I think we could have not had the row. If uh, the idea that, you know, I, again, if I, I've got, can I do this? Yeah, a couple of minutes. Uh, 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 you know, having said, I never got involved in, 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 in um, this, this aspect of politics, you know, identity politics, really it is. I never got involved in that. And in fact, down the years, I have spoken at synagogues on a Sunday night, sometimes on question time, and I often get attacked there because of my criticisms of Israel. So if anything, I wasn't seen as a, you know, good Jew by the Jewish community. Uh, but I started getting a lot of anti-Semitic stuff um, um, on uh, Twitter, on email, on letters. I mean, recently, you know, in the last two months, we've sent eight letters, eight letters to the police, five of which are, they classify as crimes. Um, uh, so it's pretty horrid stuff. Uh, and it, I think the reason it's emerged recently in the Labour, it was always there. I mean, I said to you before we came here, I used to deal with Ken Livingston in the 80s. And, I, you know, he was leader of the GLC. I was leading for Labour in London and leader in Islington. And I used to come home from meetings and say to my husband, I think he's been anti-Semitic. And I'd say, oh, he can't be. He's such an anti-racist. He can't be. So I never did anything. I thought it was my paranoia, not what he was actually saying. And of course I was wrong. And I think the reason it's emerged is that because the um, extreme left have now taken over uh, uh, control of the Labour Party, it's allowed things to happen. And the difficulty is that people cannot distinguish. There's a sort of morphing, a coming together of being Jewish, believing that there should be a state of Israel, and being a supporter of the Netanyahu um, government and people just think if you're a Jew you must be a Netanyahu fan or you must be you know the, the amount of stuff I get saying you're in the pay of Netanyahu or you know you're a Zionist bitch and that sort of stuff which is just not you know what I believe in and then the other thing that I think is a bit difficult with some of these far left groups is that there's a sort of feeling that Jew money you know and that is anti-Semitism, the, the, the controllers of dirty capitalism. And then there's also this thing about the Jews in America and this anti-American feeling. So all that gets morphed together. And, it's, and, and I'm afraid, has it gone? No. I think, thank God we've finally accepted the definition. We should have done that. You know, what arrogance to think that we, when we had this problem in the party, should be the ones to challenge the definition. If it's not good enough, I think you can, in the same way as I built consensus at PAC, mm. build, have people in the room together, bring the Palestinians together with the mainstream Jewish communities, talk about the definition. We should all allow legitimate criticism of um, uh, the actions of any government, including the Israeli government, and amend the definition in a consensual way. But no, that's not what was wanted. Is it enough? No, we've now got to see what action they take about against far too many anti-Semites who are still active in the Labour Party, who are still in positions of power. Uh, one of the characters on the National Executive Committee, if any of you listen, and I urge you to do so, not just what he said, but how he said it at the NEC meeting when they discussed the uh, adopting or not of the definition. It was so vile. In, its, in, 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 in the way he delivered it. It was anti-Semitic. So I have to see action. And I think saying sorry wouldn't be a bad start. Sorry for endorsing a mural, which again, if I urge you to look at, two seconds of looking at it is anti-Semitic. Sorry for saying that Zionists haven't got a British sense of irony. I think that wouldn't go down badly. And start talking to the mainstream um, British Jewish organisations. Okay. 
Now, typically, I can see more hands going up just as we're running out of time. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take one. I'm going to take this lady here, and then we're going to... Wind up. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Margaret, I'd just like to ask you what your view is of um, Donald Trump's sighting of the new US embassy in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, your view of it, what do you think his motivation was? And the sighting of a new Jewish, uh, a new American embassy oh, in Jerusalem. Terrible. <laughs> Absolutely terrible. So what, what terrible. Do you, you think it's terrible? Good. <laughs> what, what, what do you think his motivation was in, in doing it? The Jewish and vote. All, and I, all mean, I think it was the Jewish vote. I think that was terrible, because it makes the whole concept of a two-country um, uh, a, a solution that much more difficult to achieve. I've, I've been to Israel a few times. I went to Israel as a student. I went and worked on a kibbutz for six months. I thought I was in absolute heaven. This was in this, before the Six Day War, so it was very, very long time ago. You know, we toiled the soil until from three in the morning till 10, and then we sat around talking socialism around the swimming pool for the rest of the day. I thought it was bliss. I've been back a few times since, and it's a, it's a very difficult society. Doesn't mean I don't think it should be there. It's got to be there. But it's a very, and I thought that was the most appalling move. Absolutely terrible, terrible. Can I ask you just uh, before we conclude, I'm sorry to the gentleman there who's keen to get in, but um, first of all, can I say thank you because we've managed to get through the whole discussion and no one's used the word Brexit once. It's <laughs> just. <laughs> can, <laughs> uh, but if I just conclude on this point though, um, given everything that's going on at the moment in politics, how come the Labour Party is not 20 points ahead in the opinion poll? I think you know where I stand on that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, we should be. We should be. And I just wish for the sake of my, my people, you know, my Barking people, who I just care passionately about. I'm sure you all, those of you here, care passionately about. But I do care. I've, been, I've represented them for 25 years, so, so not, and I really love them to bits. And it's terrible, you know, and I look at, I mean, you know, whether I look at housing, whether I look at the benefits and the way the universal credit's coming in, um, whether I look at jobs, whether I look at education, whether I look at immigration and all that stuff and how, you know, this hostile environment has impacted everything out of it. They're crying out, crying out for a Labour government that will really improve their life, not a Labour party that looks inwards and simply thinks posturing is the way to achieve change. Right. Margaret, thank you very much. I should also say I took that question from Facebook. There was another question about culture. We won't go there. But can I just say thank you very much, um, and can I ask you, ladies, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this afternoon. I hope you will enjoy more of the festival. There are <coughs> several other guests today, Tom Devine, uh, Darren McGarvey, also known as Loki, and lots of other activities today and tomorrow, Professor Mary Beard tomorrow. Uh, but can I ask you to join me in thanking Dame Margaret Hodge. <laughs>